All right, guys, I don't see any reason to spend much more time on Chapter 13. We've already covered the core concepts, which is the idea that you can write a class and then you can extend it. And so the class that you're extending is called the superclass, and the classes that are doing the extending are the subclasses. Other textbooks would call them the parent class and the child class, with the child class being the one that's extending. The other term for that is inheriting from. Some uh, languages use the keyword inherit. So, don't need to talk too much more about that, but we're going to hit some related topics. All right. Which is the idea of an abstract class and an interface. And both of those also use the idea of extending, of inheritance. They are other forms of inheritance. An abstract class is a direct form of inheritance. An interface is kind of a slightly different form of, of uh, inheritance. And we'll talk about both. So for our silly quiz questions that they always tack on to the end of the PowerPoints. In the book, what is the type of thing used as an example of composition hierarchy? I don't remember, so forget it. What word indicates that a class is derived from another class? What word do we use to derive in this language? Yeah, we use extends. Yes, the classes are, I mean, like I said, the quizzes are always a little bit childish. But that is the key word that we use in this language in order to specify the class that we are inheriting from. What is it called, this is a little bit better, although this answer is stupid. What is it called when a subclass has a method with the same name and the same parameter types as a superclass? Yeah, it's called, it's overriding, right? And that's why we add the at override, or we can, the optional at override tag when we create a two-string method or an equals method that tells the compiler, oh, by the way, this is overriding. It doesn't make it, it guarantees that it really is an overriding, that the method that it is trying to replace matches it exactly, and it will give you an error. If you don't do that, then you don't have a clue whether it's actually overriding it or not. You can do it, so it's just an optional one that helps the compiler. And then what access modifier can be used in a class name to prevent someone from making a subclass? Yeah, eunuch, give me a break. Okay, final. If you mark your class as final, then nobody can extend it. And I never even thought about doing that, but if you ever think of a reason to do that, you can do that. Which of the following is not? Oh, come on. I don't care. All right, so that's Chapter 13. Now, Chapter 14 is a bunch of review because I've been hammering this stuff already. I've been hammering the idea, not of inheritance and polymorphism. That stuff is new, or, you know, relatively new. But check out the things that they want us to talk about. The object class, the equals method, and the two-string method. And that stuff is so useful that I introduced it before this chapter. We've been talking about that since like three, week three or something like that, writing a two-string method. And then about week six, we hit the equals method. But then there's some other stuff. And then the textbook talks about something that the PowerPoint doesn't, which is interface. Now, I happen to believe interfaces are very important. So even though there's not a PowerPoint about it, you're going to read the book about it, and I'm going to lecture on it. So the object class, that's the superclass for everything. So since it's a superclass for everything, we don't have to do extends object. It's just automatically there. So we've been using two methods from the objects class. We've been overriding dot equals and dot two string. And I don't remember what, object, what other uh, methods the object class gives us. I'm going to take a quick peek just by creating a new project. You probably know that we're going to need a new project. So anyways, I feel like creating an object. Object O equals new object. And then O dot equals, yeah, notify wakes up a thread. We haven't talked about threading yet. I really do want to devote a, a class lecture to the idea of threading and operating system access. Notify all has also to do with threading. A thread, a process, is like your application. 
the computer runs the process separately from another process. It's called, you know, the ability to do that. Computers did not have that ability until the 60s in order to have multiple processes running on the same machine so that multiple users could be running programs on the same machine because, you know, you'd spend $10 million installing a computer. You'd like for more than one program to be able to run it on it at the same time. Two string? Yep. All right, I'm seeing why we only talk about these. Causes another current thread. Okay, so the rest of these are all threading commands. So the ones that we care about are two string and dot equals. Dot equals, all it does is compare the address. Are these two addresses the same? Which usually is not what we want. Usually we want to compare the contents, right? Because if you have two car objects that have the same VIN number and the same everything, we want them to be counted as the same. But all it's going to do is make sure that they're saved in the same memory address, which is probably not likely. So that's why we override dot equals. And we do two strings, so it has a nice way of converting itself to string data for, what a, for whatever purpose, whether it's just to print a nice debug message on the screen or whether, you know, that actually gets converted in the data that's going to be displayed on a user interface or something like that. So that's why we add two string. Otherwise, all a two string does is print out a hashed form of the address, you know, preceded by the object name which is kind of useful, but, you know, if I print out a car, I don't want, just want to see car at followed by some hex digits. I want to see some really good stuff there. I want to see it print out the VIN number and, the, you know, the make and the model and all that stuff. So the object equals class method equals dot equals returns true if they point to the same object. They point to the same address. Usually we don't want to do that. So we usually want to override it. Usually we want to compare the contents of the two objects. And we've done this already. I'm not sure that I need to spend any more time on it. But, you know, if we have a class, you know, cat, and all we care about the cat is, you know, what's his favorite cat food? you know, string, cat food, and so whatever. If we're going to write a dot equals method, it returns a Boolean value, and what it takes is a, another object. Now, you'd like for it to be able to take another cat, right? You know, you don't want to be comparing cats and dogs, but we have to do that. We have to take it as an object, and then we have to cast it as our own type. What we probably want to do is to see if it's another cat and rule that out immediately. So if not O instance of cat, then return false, right? Somebody passed in a dog object. And we don't even want to take the time. Not just return, but return false. Then we start comparing the uh, you know, the individual contents of it, the individual variables. So if, well, but we have to cast it first. Cat, you know, other is equal to, then we have to cast the object that was passed in. Now we have a reference to a cat that we can play with. So if this dot other, excuse me, if this dot cat food dot equals, because remember, you can't use equal equal. When you take C++, we'll hit the idea of, excuse me, operator overriding, where you can actually make equal equal do what you want to do. But we always want to use dot equals on objects. Only primitive data types don't support dot equals. All right, and then so we're going to see that it, return sure, right? If the, this guy's cat food matches the other guy's cat food, then we're good to go. Now, actually, the way I like to word it is not and then return false so that I can have a whole bunch of different methods. If we have both a string of cat food and we have a string, you know, called name, then we want to compare all of those things. If not this dot name dot equals the other object's name and return false. I'd rather do that than write one complex 
statement that checked 20 different variables to see if they were same, and if they did, then return true. So if not proven guilty, then it's innocent. So by the time we get there, we can return true after we've done all of our comparisons. So if we were doing this at this point, NetBeans would offer to add the override. And what that does is it tells the compiler, make sure with, that we actually match the syntax, the method of the one from the object class. And why would you do that? Because if you mess that up, then when you try to call dot equals on it, it's not going to know what to do. It's not going to be of the correct syntax. So that's what that's for. And I know we've talked about that. Then we can add a toString method. A toString method returns a string. So again, it's an overriding of the one that's in the object class. It returns a string. It doesn't take another object, right? It just uses this one. And here, the absolute simplest one we could do. Return this dot name plus loves space plus this dot cat food. Right. That'd be enough. Just build a string that just that returns useful information. And I do have volume, do I not? Well, it's kind of lame. Not much volume, but better than the classes where I recorded and we didn't have any audio track at all. All right, so that's the idea of overriding. This is about the third time we've mentioned it, so I hope it's boiled into our brain. The reason we keep doing it, though, is because you can also override the methods of your own classes. And that's going to actually become critical when we talk about abstract classes and interfaces. So I hope it doesn't seem like we're flying through the, the chapter, but the fact is, is that we've already talked about this stuff more than once. We just talked about it without having a PowerPoint in front of it. So the classes that ship with Java, a lot of them override dot to string. For example, if you print out a string, right, it doesn't print out the word string followed by a hashed address. It actually prints the contents of the string. The date method, if you try to print out a date, it doesn't print date followed by some hexadecimal digits. It actually prints the date, you know, in a human readable format. So since retrieving the contents of an object is such a common need, you should get in the habit of providing a two-string method for just about everything. That's why I consider that one of my five recommendations. Yeah, data private, and I know this is, you know, members public. A constructor, parameterized constructor, if it helps make the code easier to write, makes using the class easier. To string and dot equals. So the JVM automatically calls toString if it needs to. And what do I mean by that? If your method accepts a string as its uh, parameter, as its argument, and then you pass an object to it, it's going to call toString on it in order for that string to be passed to the method. So once we had our cat class, if we wanted to write a method that, you know, would print something out, whatever, just pretend that we're in another class, you know, and then we have another method, you know, that takes a string for whatever reason, void, string, print invoice, and it takes the name of the critter, or, you know, it takes some kind of data, who cares what kind of data, 
How about string animal? Then when you use that somewhere down in main, if you call print invoice and you pass in the cat object, fluffy. Since it's expecting a string, it calls dot to string on it without us having to invoke dot to string. Nothing wrong with saying print invoice fluffy dot to string. It's just not necessary. So wrapper classes have two string methods. All of the wrapper classes, like float and double and integer and stuff like that, have a two string method that'll convert the contents, the double or the float or whatever, to a string. Now, that's useful because if you try to print a, pass a primitive double or a primitive int or something to a method that demands a string, it's not going to work. But if you store that in a wrapper class, and then send it off, it's going to work. Now, are there other ways of converting things to, two, to strings in order to pass them to methods? Yeah, there are. But if you store the value in an integer, then then call the method with that. Then it calls about two string on it automatically. So polymorphism. We talked about that last chapter, but here we're actually defining it when you can use different types of objects that respond differently to the same method call. To implement polymorphic behavior, there's more than one way, declare a general type of reference variable that is able to refer to objects of different types. So to declare a general type of reference variable, use a superclass. Later we'll use a programmer-defined superclass. For now we'll keep things simple and use a predefined object class. No, we won't. So in the following pets program, notice how object is declared to be an object and then toString exhibits polymorphic behavior. So if the object is a dog, the toString prints wolf wolf just because they wrote, you know, the dog object to say wolf wolf. And then if the object contains a cat, then when a toString is called, it prints meow meow because that's how they specify their cat class. So the dog class doesn't have anything but two string returns wolf wolf. The cat class doesn't have anything, but when it, uh, and when I mean doesn't have anything, it doesn't have any, you know, data or methods other than two string. But when two string is called, it returns meow meow. So they create an object, and then later on they do object is equal to new dog, or object is equal to new cat. Now notice what they're doing here is that they're using the root class object. What I'd recommend is we write our own class and we inherit from it to create our dog and our cat class, right? So that, you know, we have animal up here because we've created a animal class and then dog and cat both inherit from animal. Kind of, lim uh, you know, kind of narrows down what we're actually doing. But anyways, if we print out, we wouldn't even have to call two string, right? Let's just make it a fancy. If we delete this two string thing, I guess they're just trying to illustrate that both of them would uh, print out the same thing, right? Because calling object.toString is the same thing as calling, you know, just print line on the object. But it's exhibiting polymorphic behavior. When toString is called, it would either call the cat's toString method or the dog's toString method, depending upon what type of object it is. And print line doesn't know. It has no idea whether we're talking about a cat or a dog. So there's no sneaky code in there checking to see, you know, if this object is instance, or excuse me, instance of cat or instance of dog. That's another way to do polymorphism. I, th I believe the book even shows that, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it, in my opinion. The best way to do it is to create a superclass and inherit from it, or to create an interface, which we will talk about pretty soon. All right, then it, the chapter does go off into something we haven't talked about already. Dynamic binding. Polymorphism is a concept. Dynamic binding is a description of how it's implemented. That means that the code doesn't stitch the method calls together in 
until it's run. It does it at runtime, not when the compiler makes it. And why does it do that? So that uh, you know it can call the right version of toString or the right version of the overridden method. You know, and so what it does is it checks. It starts at the top of the chain. Actually, it starts at the bottom. You know, so checks to see if this is a cat. Does the cat have that method? No, it doesn't. It checks the one that it inherits from. And if that one doesn't have it, it checks if that one has it. But it does it at runtime. So dynamic binding is what the Java virtual machine does in order to match up the method call with a particular method, the cat's two-string method or the dog's two-string method. So just before it executes the method call, it looks at the calling object. So if we have a cat, and then we're calling to string, it looks at that object. It looks at the type of the object that has been assigned into the calling object's reference variable. If the assigned object is from that class, it binds classes X to the method call. So we're ready to go. If the assigned object is from class Y, it binds Y's method to the method call. After the Java virtual machine binds the appropriate method to the method call, it executes that bound method. Now, this doesn't talk about walking up the inheritance chain to find the right one. So be aware of these compiler issues related to dynamic binding. It checks to see if the reference variables class has that method. Normally, when you assign an object into a reference variable, the object's class and the reference variable's class are the same. But in the case of the cat and dog, we created them as type object. So the dog was assigned into a reference variable of type object. Such assignments only work if the right side's class is a subclass of the left side's class. What they mean by right side and left side, the left side is the one that takes this and then the right side is the one that's being created, right? And so he has to be a subclass to that, or else this statement wouldn't work, right? Yes, everything is an object, so that would work. But if we did cat c is equal to new dog, well, a dog does not inherit from cat, so that statement would fail. And so here they go. And they do an illustration with arrays. I always do array lists. The real usefulness of polymorphism comes when you have an array of generic reference types and assign different types of objects to different elements in the array or the array list. You have a bunch of characters in a game running around on screen. Some of them are monsters and some of them are player characters. You define a root, a superclass, and then you inherit both the player characters and the monsters from it and then you're going to have your array list of those guys along with their positions in the screen. And then when you invoke a method, you pass that array list to it or you pass that object to it, and as it needs to handle it, like to draw it on the screen or something like that, it would invoke that object's proper methods. How does it know to do that? I would create that method in the superclass and override it in the subclass. They show doing something a little bit different. They show using instance of which we talked about last week, is the primitive way of doing it. So at runtime, okay, so that allows you to step through the array. And for every array element, you call the polymorphic method. So another example they do is of having a calculate pay. So you have two classes. Class full-timer, or, you know, salaried. And then you have another class, hourly. And I'm going to skip all the data and stuff like that. And then we have a class, employee, which both of them inherit from. So salary extends employee. Hourly extends employee. Now we would put all the information that is common, that is shared by salaried and hourly employee, like their names and stuff like that up here. But specifically, I want something that will calculate their pay, calculate their weekly pay. So double calc weekly pay. And in this version of it, I'm just going to return zero. 
but I'm going to override that in these methods. So when we do a salaried employee or an hourly employee, well, the salary employee probably just has a weekly salary, right, or monthly salary or yearly salary. So he's going to have some variable called weekly salary. And the calc weekly pay is just going to return that, right? Double calc weekly pay. You know, I'm not dividing, um, defining my methods correctly. They should have their little parentheses. That one's going to return that variable. Return this dot weekly salary. And I hope it's okay that I'm not actually making, I'll type this stuff. Then a hourly employee doesn't have a weekly salary. Instead, they have a hourly salary. And they have a number of hours that they work that week. So then the double calc weekly pay, let's go ahead and add the at override because we're overriding that guy's method. So when we override calc weekly pay here, it's not going to return weekly salary because that doesn't exist in this method. It's going to instead return this dot hourly times this dot hours worked. I almost wish I'd made you do this. Then when you create an array list of these guys, somewhere down in Maine, you know, array list of employees, equals new array list, like that. We add a couple of employees to it, you know. Salaried employee Fred equals new salaried, and we set all the values that we need to. We're skipping that step, right? We don't have getters and setters and stuff like that. And then hourly employee John is equal to a new hourly employee. We add both of those to our array list. I never remember if it's adds or append. So we add Fred to it, and we add John to it. And then we can get their total salary if we need to. So double, you know, salary for this week is equal to Fred dot calc weekly pay plus John dot calc weekly pay. And so how does this binding work? Well, when we call Fred Calc Weekly Pay, it looks to see what type of object it is. Now it happens to know what type of object it is because it just checks. Yeah, we're a salaried object. Awesome. It goes and it checks salary. Do we have that, uh, that method? Yeah, we do. So that's the one that gets bound to that and that's the one that gets invoked. Same for John. When we call John, it's going to call Calc Weekly Pay. So, it checks. John is an hourly employee. Does it have that method? Now, if it didn't, if that was commented out, it would run up the chain. I don't have a calc weekly pay, so I'm going to check the employee class, my super class, my parent class. Aha, we got one there, and it would just return zero. Uncomment that out. Okay, hope that makes sense. It's bugging me that I don't remember whether it's dot .adds or dot .append, so why don't we Google that real quickly. Yeah, it is. All right. Good. Python, it's a pin. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Now, what if we hadn't called this an hourly and a salary? What if we had called this an object? Object Fred is equal to new salary. Or if we call it employee Fred is equal to new salary. Would it be able to call Calc Weekly Pay? No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't know whether it was a salary or an hourly, so it wouldn't know which one to call. So it'd wind up using that one, which would return zero. 
if we can cast it before we call Calc Weekly Pay, then yes, we could force it to do to be bound to one or to the other. That makes sense. Okay. All right. The thing to note here is we have this completely useless method here, right? All it does is return zero. The only reason this method exists is so that we can override it. The way Java handles that, or encourages programmers to handle that, is to mark this as an abstract method. If you mark a method as abstract, it says this method has no body. And then anything that extends it absolutely has to override it, implement it. If it doesn't override it, if it doesn't implement it, it's not an employee. So if we tack the word abstract onto here, then we're saying, okay, if you're an employee, if, you're ex if you extend the employee class, you absolutely have to add a calc weekly pay. So you're kind of writing a contract. You're saying, okay, anytime, anything that I write that is an employee, that extends employee, there's that is a relationship, right? There's is a and has a. Is a is inheritance. Has a is composition. We have weekly salary, you know, because the salaried employee has a salary. It's about time to actually type this stuff in because I want us to use the abstract keyword. So as usual, I'm going to say always put each object in its own class and then I'm going to violate that. So we're just going to define a class called character. And we're going to say that every character has to be able to say hello, has to have a greetings method. But we're not going to specify what the generic greeting method is. So what you're going to want to do is create a new, um, if you're going to catch up, create a new. We just started typing. We've done the lecture, but we just started typing. So the only thing this class has, well, let, let's go ahead and give it a name. We always have to give things names. But then we want the character to be able to say hello for whatever purpose. So void greeting. But we're going to mark it as abstract. We're not going to even provide a body for this. So we're going to use the abstract keyword. And then we're going to get an error. The error is that once you mark any method of a class as abstract, you have to mark the class as abstract as well. OK, I'll do that. You come up here and mark the class as abstract. I need to delete that. That's not part of this project. Something's looking odd here. I have way too many windows open, eating up my space. But anyways, all right, it's an abstract class. Awesome. I'm going to make a character. Character Thor is equal to new character. And it gives me grief. It won't compile. Why? Because it's an abstract class. You cannot instantiate an abstract class. It can only ab, um, instantiate something that is inherited from the abstract class. Now, why is that? Because there is no definition of what the greeting is. So how could we create a character if it wouldn't know what method, how to do the greeting? This has no implementation. You can stick non-abstract methods inside of an abstract class if you want to. We could kind of prove that to ourselves. We're going to write another meeting called goodbye. Excuse me, another method called goodbye. And all it does is system.out.println later. Like that. Oh, you're giving me grief. You're going to tell me I can't do it? Abstract methods cannot have a body. Okay, I made a mistake. Once you define a class as abstract, it cannot have non-abstract methods. I forgot. So I'm going to delete that. I'm going to delete that entire line. I'm not going to fuss with it. So what do I want to do now? I want to create 
a class that extends character and then can implement that trait. So, class player extends character and every player has to be able to say their name. He's complaining right now. Why do you think he's complaining? Without covering up, without hovering my cursor over player to find out what the error is. Why? What looks wrong about this? It has to do with that abstract keyword on the greeting. We don't have a greeting method, so it can't be a character. When you mark something as abstract, you're saying anything that extends from it has to implement that. Or also has to declare it as abstract. So we will add a greeting method. Void greeting system dot out dot print line. Hello. Or I am followed by their name. This dot name. I think I forgot a closing uh, curly brace over here. So I'm trying to fit too much on one line. And you know the reason why I, I arrange it like that is just to get the most stuff on the screen at the same time for y'all. Certainly don't recommend that you do that. Not a must. All right, now we can create a character. Still give me grief. Oh, why is that? Because we can't do character Thor because character is the abstract class. Instead, we have to say player Thor is equal to new player. And let's give Thor a name. Thor's dot name is equal to Thor. And let's make Thor give a greeting. Thor dot greeting. So is there any reason to do this? Right. Not for this simple of an example. If you only have one class extending from the other class, then you don't need to set up an inheritance hierarchy at all. The power of an inheritance comes in when you have multiple classes that come from one superclass. We might have something else called a non-player character that also extends character, and it does something else. It has different behaviors. You know, maybe it doesn't query the joystick for which direction it's supposed to be going or whatever because the computer's going to be providing that information instead. Or whatever different attributes a non-player character would have as opposed to a character. And then the abstract class would define everything that both of the subclasses have to have, must have, in order to be a character. Now, do you have to do it that way? It's not a must. You could make this a non-abstract class, and then you could give yourself dummy methods like I did when I did return zero, you know? Just make it do nothing. But then when you extend that class, you don't have to abide by any rules, right? You don't have to override those dummy methods. The abstract keyword forces you to override that dummy method because it doesn't have a body. So that's what an abstract class is, which is the next chapter. But this chapter, for some excuse me, this book for some reason introduces the idea of abstract classes after they talk about interfaces. And I think that they should go in the other way. When we talk about the inheritance hierarchy, you can only inherit from one class, which is different than C++. We could only say extends character, comma. We can't say extends character, extends monster if we have a player who's both a character and a monster. Because we can only use one class. We can only have one superclass in this language. They chose that because the idea of having multiple classes that you inherit from is pretty problematic, right? What if you have two classes that have the same method and you inherit from both of them? Which time is it going to do that? Uh,
So the idea of an interface is that you can extend from multiple interfaces, but I need to change that word extend. You extend from a superclass, but you implement an interface. So what does that mean? You put the, in, the information for different behaviors in an interface. For example, we're playing a medieval role-playing game. Our players could either be wizards or they could be fighters, right? Maybe you could have a wizard and a fighter. So those are interfaces. You would define some kind of interface that gives wizardly behavior. And then you would define another kind of interface that gives you fighter behavior. And then whatever subclass needs to be a fighter would use the word implements wizard or implements fighter. So let's do that. Let's define a couple of interfaces. So let's write an interface called spellcaster. And we are going to give it a method, not an abstract method. We're just going to give it a good old honest method. So if they call cast, like casting a spell, right, void cast. I shouldn't use the word cast because we've been using casting as a, you know, we know what we mean. Okay, the whole word, cast spell. And then system.out.println, fireball. All right. Whatever. Abstract methods cannot have a body. Alrighty. I forgot that. Okay, so this would be an abstract class. I need to remove that, and it's an abstract class that we will then, anybody who is a spellcaster will have to provide a method for that. What if you are a fighter? Interface fighter. They don't have the ability to cast spells. They have the ability to use a longbow. So abstract void shoot bow. And what are we going to do next? We're going to make a class called wizard that is a player and is a spellcaster. So we're going to use class wizard extends player implements spellcaster. But you could also come up with a class that implemented both spellcaster and fighter. So I'm going to come down here and do that. So class wizard extends the player class and it implements the fighter interface. And it starts giving me grief about that because it wants me to implement everything that we have to implement. It is not abstract and does not override the abstract method shoot bow. Because shoot bow is an abstract method, if we implement it, we have to implement that method. We have to provide it. Or we have to declare this class abstract as well so that the next guy who inherits us can implement. So, void, shoot bow, and when we call that, it's just going to print out pew pew, system.out.println, pew pew, end quote, end parentheses, semicolon, end brace. Seems like I've got an error there. Alrighty, it says that shoot bow and wizard cannot implement shoot bow and fighter. We are attempting to assign a weaker access privilege. It was public. Now, honestly, I don't see us declaring this as public. Since we didn't give it a public or private keyword, its scope is class, which means anybody in the same file 
can access it. Anybody in the same project should be able to access it. But okay, okay, if it's going to make us do it, public void shoot bow. Oh, come on. Missing method body or declare abstract. Add at override. I don't see the missing method body. Oh, what am I doing wrong? Do you, do you spot it? Yeah, yeah, get rid of the semicolon. Can I then get rid of the word public? No. All right. Fine. So see you Tuesday. Did you get to finish your exam? Yeah, I was done. I logged off, finished my Oh, great, great. Kick the power cord, see what happens. <laughs> All righty. So that's our wizard. Implement. Wait a minute. Why did I do a wizard that extends a fighter? That's kind of dumb. What's another name for fighter? Knight. Our knight extends fighter. Now implement a wizard class, or you know, create a wizard class that extends player implements spellcaster. Go ahead and do that on your own, or at least give it a start. And by the way, one of the, uh, the warnings that it's giving me, it's suggesting that I make this method static. That would be a fair thing to do because this doesn't use any data, right? But how many times are you going to write a method that doesn't use any data? So I'm not going to make it static. When I cast my bow, I'd need to have some data about that bow, you know, its range and stuff like that, or how many arrows I had left, or something like that. It would wind up using some data from that class. It's also suggesting that I add the at override syntax, which is fine by me. Oh, now it's not offering to make it static. Okay, that's cool. Forgive me, I need to take a super quick. So to create our wizard. Class wizard extends our player, implements spellcaster. And I'm just going to copy and paste. Except that he doesn't shoot a bow, he casts a spell. Cast spell, and instead of saying pew pew, he goes fireball or whatever you made him say. I cast magic missile. All right. Now I've got a mistake here. I need to make it lowercase. I made shoot bow uppercase. I made cast spell lowercase. So if you made cast spell uppercase, leave it like that. All right. Now I'm going to make one more guy who extends both of those. I can't think of what to call him. Somebody who can both fight and cast spells. Like class Warrior Wizard. Extends player with a capital P. And implements fighter, comma, spellcaster but no semicolon at the end. And it's giving me that warning. It's not abstract and it does not, abs does not override the appropriate methods. 
So we need to override both shoot bow and cast spell. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to copy and paste the shoot bow method from the knight. But I want to make it say something different. I don't know. Huzzah. <laughs> and then I'm going to steal the cast spell method from the wizard class and paste it. But instead of saying fireball, he's going to say zap. Alright, why do you do that? Well, you may need to implement a method that only handles stuff related to spellcasters. And now we're not doing that polymorphism where everything extends from the same class. But yet, we could make a whole bunch of different classes that implement the spellcaster. You know, the druid class, the, you know, the sorcerer class, or whatever. And you could send any of those to the method that needed a spellcaster interface. But you wouldn't be able to send the knight to the spellcaster interface. Kind of breaks that polymorphism a little bit, but that's why the textbook shows using instance of. You know, if you add a whole bunch of these things together and you want some of them to cast spells and some of them not, you could do is instance of. And if it's an instance of a spellcaster, then great. So why bother doing this rather than just using inheritance? Because you can only inherit from one class, but you can implement as many different interfaces as you want. Fighter, spellcaster, thieving abilities, flying, whatever you needed to be able to do. You can make a different interface for each one of those. And then one class could have three of them, one class could have seven of those abilities, one class could have none of them, right? Now, we never actually made any of these characters. And we never made a method that uses them. That would be about the last thing that we would do. So Thor is not going to be a player. Thor is going to be a knight. So I'm going to say knight Thor is equal to new knight. I could say player Thor, right? Maybe I don't even know what type he is. And then I'm going to make Gandalf. Player Gandalf equals new wizard. Let's make an array that has both of them. Player. Um, I need a list of players. Party. Equals. And then we have both Thor and Gandalf in our party. And we could pass that array to a method. You know, attack the monster. But the method would have to check. Is he a spellcaster? If he is, then call the spellcast method. Is he a fighter? Then go ahead and do the bow method. So, to me, the idea of polymorphism seems more true if you use a uh, inheritance, if you use extends. But I also see why implements is a perfectly good example of polymorphism. If you define something else that can only accept spellcasters, you could do that. And one of the examples we'll see, like, maybe um, next week, is that Java comes with a whole bunch of interfaces. One called serializable. Serializable is a method excuse me, an interface. And what it does is it will turn your object into a stream of bytes. And that stream of bytes could be written to a file, the stream of bytes could be sent down a socket on the internet, anything that will accept a serializable object. And the reason we're going to do that is so that we can write out an object with one fell swoop, with just one call, it'll save it to a file, rather than write out each piece of data in the object. You could have a class that had seven million pieces of, you know, seven million members, and then still with one call, you could save it to file. And then you could read it back in from the file with one call, but only if it implements a serializable interface. Now, weirdly, all you have to do is add implements serializable. You don't have to add any methods. 
which I don't understand because when we did implements, we had to then go and put some abstract methods in. Why don't we have to implement some methods in order to use the serializable class? Anyways, we will see that next week when we talk about file I.O. All right, we didn't do anything with these guys, so why don't we make an attack method that takes a list of players? So public static void attack, and he takes an array of players, or heck, he just takes one player. We'll use a for loop to call him. But we have to see, before he uses the bow, if he is a spellcaster. So if player instance of spellcaster, then call player dot cast spell. But notice what it did as I was typing it. It filled in something for me. I was going to make a mistake, and it went ahead and corrected it for me. It cast. NetBeans went ahead and provided the code to cast our object to the spellcaster class before it did dot cast spell. Why is that? Because we have to know that it's a spellcaster. The dynamic binding can't occur, right, if it's a player, because player is above the hierarchy, above cast spell. What that would look like if it hadn't been, if NetBeans hadn't been so fancy as this. Spellcaster SP is equal to parentheses, spellcaster, end parentheses, player, and then we could call it sp.castspell. The syntax below just does that all at the same time, right? And then write the same code if player instance of fighter. That would be the last thing we do. So add one more method that does it player instance of fighter and it invokes the correct spell. Excuse me, invokes the fighter's attack, which is use bow or fire bow. Shoot bow, that's what it was. And that warrior wizard, we never created a warrior wizard, but if we passed a warrior wizard into this method, it would do both a cast of a spell and a shooting of the bow. Because it's an instance of a spellcaster and of a fighter. That's how we defined our warrior wizard. So I'm going to go ahead and type. If player instance of fighter cast it to a fighter. Fighter F equals cast. Fighter end cast player. And then call F dot shoot bow. Now those methods ought to print out the character's name, right? So we could see Thor you know, use his fighter abilities, and so we can see Gandalf, you know, that he was the one casting the spell, but whatever. Now, down here at the bottom, after I created those two methods, I want to actually use them. So, attack using party member zero. And, if you know, we ought to make this a loop. Attack using party member one. And let's run it and see if it actually compiles and runs. I'm not sure I've run it at all since I began typing this, so it'd be a miracle if it works, but we'll see. All right. He says, I am Thor. We didn't give Gandalf a name, or, you know. Well, let's, let's do that. I do want to make this complete. Okay. So, I'm going to take this call to greeting out, but after I create Gandalf, I want to give Gandalf a name. Gandalf name equals, of course, Gandalf. And that greeting call that we removed, go and make it the first line of code in the attack method. Or 
we could just say, you know, print dot name attacks. I'll do that. All right. So the first line of my attack method is going to be a system dot out dot print line. This dot name. No, I can't say this dot. We don't have a this reference. Player dot name plus quote space attacks. End quote in parentheses semicolon. Then run it once more. Why are you giving me grief here? Exporting non-public type through public API. Whatever. So when we run it, Thor attacks, pew pew, Gandalf attacks, fireball, and if we created a warrior wizard, he would do both. We have time for that? I think so. Is it compiling for y'all? I don't want to go too fast. If I move the curly brace up here, I can get the entire method on one screen. Sound like the guy from Motley Crue, Nikki. All right, so I'm going to go down here, create a warrior wizard. So down here at the bottom, warrior wizard trogdar equals new warrior wizard. See, wouldn't it be nice if we'd made a constructor that would accept his name? as we created the object. And then trogdars.name is equal to trogdar. And then call attack using trogdar. If you added him to the party, great, you know. And then attack using trogdar. Now when I run it, we should see that trogdar has both abilities since the warrior wizard implements both classes, both interfaces. There we go, Trogdar attacks. But he's got different attacks. His bow goes zap, and his spell goes huzzah, or vice versa. I forget which. I should have put slightly better text in my attacks, right? But that gives the idea. You see that he's doing both. All right. We've seen abstract classes. Abstract classes are classes that have abstract methods. What are abstract methods? They are methods that don't have a body. Any class that implements, that it extends, excuse me, an abstract class, has to fill in that method or be marked as abstract itself. Pass the buck. And then an interface is a class that has abstract methods. It only has abstract methods. And then the interface, you don't extend using an interface. You use the word implements. And you can implement multiple interfaces from a class, but you can only inherit, you can only extend from one class. We got all of our code working guys? All right. Do read chapter 14, even though a lot of it is a repeat. They talk about interfaces towards the end of it, which the PowerPoint does not.